Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome to this deep dive into the old school essentials, classic and advanced fantasy books. Now, I, I usually do quick flip throughs and reviews, but on occasion I'd, I like to go a bit deeper into a particular work, and uh, I've already done that with Shadow Dark. I've gone into the I don't know, just the inner workings of it, flipped through the whole thing and given my thoughts in greater detail as I went through it. And I wanted to do that again with Old School Essentials. Now, this isn't new, I know. There's tons of reviews of Old School Essentials out there, tons of people who have gone through these books in great detail with incredible reviews. So I'm not doing this because I think it's brand new and I'm going to get you know some great new insights out there, but I do think that from time to time we need to be reminded about how awesome this dang book series is, this book set is. Old School Essentials, in my mind, is the gold standard. Really, when I'm, when I'm reading a new adventure, or, when, or I shouldn't say adventure, when I'm reading a new book, uh, an RPG book, a new setting or system, I compare, in my mind, everything to Old School Essentials. Is it as clearly laid out as the Old School Essentials books are? Is it as procedurally proficient as those books are? Is the art as good as these books? I mean, that's when I'm, when I'm looking at a new system, that's what I'm looking at. Now, one of the things that's so funny about these books is that I haven't played them all that much at the table. I haven't played OSE uh, as my system of choice very much. My players kind of bounced off of it. My online groups kind of bounced off of it. My nephews bounced off of it. Uh, my home group bounced off of it. We tried it, and it's just not for us. But I use these books all the time. I use the magic books all the time, I use the treasure books all the time, the monster books are all awesome. I have them in physical form and I'm constantly taking the little monster books and just putting them by my screen. I, I have them with me when I'm running games, even though I don't use this system. First of all, the art is so inspiring, but the creatures themselves are so clearly laid out. And again, it's the standard, it's the standard one to which I compare everything else. And I think that a lot of people maybe feel the same way. Again, I know a lot of people have their system of choice that isn't OSE. There are lots of other old school games out there. I recently reviewed Dragon Slayer. That's a great old school game. There's Labyrinth Lord, Swords and Wizardry. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different games out there that go for the BNX or Advanced D&D vibe. Old School Essentials still, in my mind, is the one to beat. Now, I think if I were to choose, and I said this before, if I were to choose to actually run a game, I would probably choose Dragon Slayer. Because of some of the ways that the combat seems to work, because of some of the choices for the, the, the races and classes, I just think it's cool. I'd like to try it out, and I think I think if push came to shove, I would end up using that one. But OSE is, in my mind, a more useful system because of the, the ease and the, I would say, just the proficiency of the systems that that game gives you. How clearly laid out all of the, the steps are for each of the things that it talks about. So I want to go through these books. I'll start with the Adventures book because I think it's my favorite. I really like the monster books. I really like the magic books. The character books are good too. The treasure books are great. But the Adventure book is my favorite because of its procedures. I think it is the absolute... It's one of those things where if you're going to run a game of D&D, right? You're going to run a game of D&D and you're trying to figure out what you like, what you don't like, like we all are, right? None of our games are ever done. We're always adding things. We're always modifying things. We're always rounding off edges and adding on bits here and there. If you're like that, and I think most of us as GMs are, then it behooves you to look at old school essentials procedures. Even if you end up rejecting them, even if you say, no, that's not for me. That's not for my table. Because of how proficient, how clear, and how solid they are, most of us on our own are not going to come up with systems that work as well as the old school essentials ones do. And again, the, these are all based on the old games and they're clarified and, and streamlined and you know printed without the errors. And I know that. So it's not like this is a genius brand new system that had never been seen before or something like that. I get that. But I mean, this particular version of them is so clear and so streamlined that if you are interested in figuring out a better way of doing inventory management, better way of doing dungeon crawling, a better way of doing overland travel. If you're trying to, if it's not clicking with you and you're trying to make it work, then compare what you're doing to old school essentials and see if there's something you can learn from it. That's how I view it anyway, because constantly I'm like, man, this is awesome. I'm going to take this bit. I'm going to take that bit. No, I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to take the rest of it. And as you'll see, I think there's a lot of things in this book that maybe we we knew at one point as GMs. I mean, you know, we read it and said, that's awesome. And then we, we drifted away from it, whatever it might be. 
you know, when I first got these books, I started using a lot of their ideas. I started using the, 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 the procedures for things like dungeon crawling, and my dungeon crawls immediately got better. Everyone was having way more fun. And then over time, my older habits kicked in again, and I started not paying as much attention, and my dungeon crawls started to get weaker again. So again, from time to time, I think it's good to remind ourselves of these rules and how awesome they are. <laughs> and I guess that's what I'm doing here. Um, so uh, again, I, I don't think I'm going to be going through um, and talking about all these great experiences I've had playing this particular game because, again, I haven't played it all that much. My players and I bounced off of it, as I said. It's a little too crunchy for us. It's a little too... Um, the, 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 the player options are a little bit too um, stiff. And I don't tend to prefer roll under systems, or rather, I don't tend to prefer systems that do different systems for for you know ability scores and for attack rolls and things like that and so some of my players didn't like that either and again we just bounced off of it but the game as a whole is incredible the game as a whole is really really incredible and one of the reasons of course is the presentation the art in these books is top notch i love it absolutely great of course jacob fleming who's one of my favorites um does this great uh initial piece for this one but there are great other artists as well. Mustafa Bakir, uh, Michael Clark, Tom Killian. I mean, just again, the, the artists in this book are really, really good. As again, anyone who's seen these books knows, these are awesome. Now, uh, again, hyperlinked table of contents, so thank you for that. <laughs> I always want to mention it because it's so good to have. This book is uh, an excellent book to have as a reference book, something you check from time to time. That's how I look at this book. It's only 57 pages uh, in, in my PDF. Uh, but it is just so to the point. It's very hard not to just love this thing. Um, now, one of the pages, first of all, art, awesome, awesome art. <laughs> but one of the things that I love about this book is how it reminds you of these little things that maybe some people automatically figured out. But me, coming from 5th edition, 3rd edition, and then 5th edition, back to the old, old school uh, the OSR games, things that weren't obvious to me. Things like having a caller. Now that might sound weird, but in 5th edition, the players aren't so much playing a team. I mean, obviously they're part of an adventuring party, but that means something else in 5th edition and in 3rd edition than it means in, you know, be it X D D or advanced D&D, older versions of the game, the OSR. To be part of a team in 5e means more like you're a Marvel superhero, part of that it's part of the Avengers, right? Where you each have your own story going on. You each have your own uh, personality and, and goals and all this stuff. And you know, it's you are you are each in charge, kind of. And and then when you come together, maybe at certain moments, there's a quote unquote party leader, someone who does most of the talking. But that's that's really not the vibe that Five E is going for, right? There might be the character who is more shy or more holds back, and the character who goes up front. But but there isn't a caller. Somebody who just says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're moving down the hallway here. We're, we as a group are going there. And to give it to a player at the table, that's certainly not how it tends to go. The idea that it's that sort of a, an idea that it's a player's role to be the caller. Certainly the mapper. I mean, that idea has completely disappeared, I think, in 5th edition for the most part. Especially with VTTs now, there's really almost no reason. With Fogs of War, there's no reason to map. Most players, a lot of players play online. You have virtual tabletops. You don't need a mapper, right? You just have somebody who... The DM just reveals the map as you go. And again, some people totally like that. But if you're playing in person, you're not using a VTT. You're playing just, you know, over, over Zoom or something like that, as me and my friends often do. Then having a mapper makes a lot of sense. It's not something that I needed to worry about in 5th edition. We, we didn't do dungeon crawling in that way. And if we did, it was the simple five-room dungeon, right? So you basically the five-room dungeon. Or a dungeon that, you know, you didn't need to navigate exploration as a part of the game just didn't exist and so the idea that we're going to have a mapper or gonna, that marching order will matter uh that just wasn't that wasn't a thing so again the, this book lays out right away hey here are some things that you are going to need to do and and i like that right away in the party organization section they talk about dividing treasure now when i ran a west marches this was something that actually hung up my players a lot i made it a rule that before they went out on a session, that particular group had to decide how they were going to divide treasure. And in, and in particular, I said, whoever called the adventure together, whoever organized it, they have to decide. They get to decide how the treasure is divided. And so, because if they didn't do that, very often the players didn't think of it. 
And again, because treasure, in most 5e games, treasure isn't that important. You don't really do spend much with your money, and there's nothing to buy in 5th edition. And, um, and magic items typically are, you know, there's attunement to magic items, and they usually are very, very specific, right? You're going to get this one, or you're going to get that one. In a West Marches game, where the kind of the world was there, and they were just going to find stuff as it went, and I made a lot more things to spend money on, I tried to make it more old school. Suddenly, treasure and its, divide, its division became really important. Uh, and the players uh, often felt a bickering. For like 20 minutes at the end of every session would be, and some people liked it, <laughs> but it was like a negotiation slash bickering about how we were going to divide up all the treasure and how we were going to divide the magic items up. Having a clear, okay, we're just going to do it right away. I really, really appreciate a game that just says, okay, make sure you do that. Again, these ideas of time, weight, and movement, simple. You know, some people don't use all of these rules, but if you're going to play an old school game, very famously Gary Gygax said that, right? That you need to keep track of time to have a game have any, you know, to be to be meaningful. Um, and uh, maybe on a on a grand scale, that's true as well, right? And for a campaign uh, to have that epic scope, you do need to have a sense of progression of time. But really, granular, granularly, granularly, uh, granularly. <laughs> I can I can speak. I can think. I think uh, to have that granular round by round, turn by turn, uh, measurement is so important in an old school exploration game because resources and the, the, the using up of your resources is how old school games function, right? It's like a, it's like a balancing resources game. It's almost like a sim, right? I have to keep my supplies up. I have to keep my light up. I have to keep my fuel up. I have to keep my spell slots up, up or my, my, my number of spells per day up. I have to keep my hit points up. Uh, as I trade those things for treasure and experience. And I'm going to be going through the dungeon and it's going to be that negotiation with myself and the dungeon and the players and the GM. How much can I push? How low can I get my resources before I get my stuff? Or before, you know, and get my stuff and then still survive and make it out. That is completely absent from new games. Fifth edition, it was pretty much absent from third edition. Um... I, that's where I started was third edition. The only resources that mattered in third and four and fourth and fifth are hit points and and abilities, right? How many abilities per day you have left? Food, water, fuel, for the most part, those things were hand waved. At least in my experience with third edition and certainly with fifth edition, they're hand waved. So having a game like Old School Essentials, the OSR, where resources and exploration are a, a pillar of the game, it's an important part of the game. Time is the essential thing you have to track. Now, what's funny is that when I first started to do the OSR, I really I recognized that exploration required resources, and so I really focused on that, but I let time slip away. I kind of hand-waved it. I was like, oh, you guys have probably been down here for, oh, yeah, it makes sense. You've been exploring the room for about 10, 15 minutes or so. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's been about two hours. You guys are probably... Yeah, it's been about... But the problem with that is that it's not a system the players have to um, contend with. That's just the DM kind of hand-waving things. That's not consistent. And to, to, to make an accurate judgment about how far we should push as players, how far we should push before we retreat, you need consistency. The DM has, so I thought I was being kind of kind to the players, or like, you know, not kind, but I thought I was making it more fun. Yeah, we're just, we're, you know, we're, uh, you don't need to be persnickety about the time you've spent searching the room, right? You don't need to worry about that. You know, yeah, you're, you're probably, you're, the duration of your light spell is still going. Yeah, it's probably fine. But when I did that, I was undercutting their decision making. I was undercutting the whole fun that comes from that kind of game, which is making those decisions. Do we push on, knowing that our resources are draining, or do we retreat? That's, that's, that's part of the fun of this style of play. And by hand-waving that stuff, I was actually undermining it. So I was forcing the players into a style of play and then undermining part of the fun. So I, I was undermining the payoff, that risk-reward. So you know, time is really, really important. Resources are really, really important and keeping them connected uh, you know, explicitly, and clearly, and consistently. That's why a procedure is so good. So this, this OSE makes that abundantly clear. One of the reasons I appreciate it so much. Uh, encumbrance is another rule. If you're going to do resource management, if you're going to do uh, time, if you're going to do exploration, encumbrance is essentially, in my view, it's essential. You, you, you have to do it. Now, you don't have to do it as they do it here. You don't have to do it in, in terms of coins. You don't have to do it in terms of pounds. You don't have to do it in terms of armored heavy. You can, you can do it your own way. But some limitation that is, again, consistent 
and the players can contend with and know what they're contending with, uh, with a payoff risk reward system has to has to be included in order, I think, for a game to have that exploration element. You have to use it. So even though here it's presented as an optional rule, I, I actually think, no, it's important to, to it's important to do. Now, I, I don't use this system. I use a slot-based system in my games. I use it from uh, the Shadow Dark system. Even before I was using Shadow Dark, I was doing it in my fifth edition games. I, I brought back in the slot-based system where uh, you know you can have a certain number of pieces of equipment based on just a standard number plus or minus strength or con, you know, depending on the kind of variant I was using at the time. What I've settled in right now is 10 plus your strength score. Or, sorry, plus your strength modifier. That's the number of, of pieces of equipment you can carry. That's what you can carry. Uh, with, you know, a certain number of coins taking up a slot, a certain number of torches being able to be stacked, and rations stacking, and things like that. But mostly, uh, you have a certain number of slots you can carry. And it does take a little bit of negotiation with players at first. For my 5e players, and again, I'm talking about people coming from 5th edition mostly. I know a lot of you guys are probably have started you know, started back in the day and have played since then and so and has stayed back you didn't you know, probably didn't embrace fifth edition in a lot of ways so this is it's going to sound like yeah obviously we have an encumbrance but again for fifth edition the idea that equipment matters the idea that uh, equipment beyond armor and weapons I should say that because armor and weapons matter in fifth edition but beyond that I, and this was also true by the way back in third edition when i started i remember it was about like two years i think or it was it was some time into playing third edition I was making my characters, and I was a kid, you know, like maybe like <laughs> 10 or 11 or something like that. And I was like, why am I doing this? Why do I, why do I keep track of how many torches I have? I never use them. I have dark vision. Or, why do I bother putting a water skin? I never mention it. Why do I write it out every time? And I started just doing adventurer's pack. And it, it was the exact same result. Do you have your adventures pack? Yeah, okay, then you can rest. You're fine. You don't have any penalties. Great. I remember the first time I, I found a use for a mirror. Like, you know, it's like it was like the signal from a distance. I caught the light on it and I flashed, you know, a message to somebody from a distance. I felt like a genius because I had found a use for a useless item in my inventory. That's how I thought of it. I was like, man, I had this useless thing in my inventory. I've just found a use for it. I felt like a genius. But it was kind of a one off thing, and I never really did that again. But the idea that a mirror is useless? No, a mirror is very useful in an old-school game. And seeing around corners, fighting Medusa, whatever you, you want to do with it, right? Setting it up so you can uh, rest safely while not looking around the corner. I think that's the big one, right? You set it up in the corner of the room so you can see movement down the hallway, even if no one's there. That's how I always thought of it in old-school games now. Um, that is really useful. But in 3rd edition, 5th edition, that didn't... 4th edition, yeah, certainly 4th edition, it didn't matter. Why bother? Why bother? So, if you're going to use equipment that matters, encumbrance has to matter, because otherwise you can just carry everything you need. This was one of my problems. When I first introduced uh, encumbrance in 5th edition, I built basically uh, mechanics so that certain classes, certain basically races, dwarves could ignore certain penalties to encumbrance, and I, I combined it. I did like a really generous, like double your strength score, and then you can have up to triple your strength score before you start to run. And it was like, I tried to make it realistic, and I tried to... The problem was, the, the one character, the dwarf in my party, just carried everything that the party could ever possibly need and completely undermined the system. There was no point for the system. It was the equivalent of having a character sheet solution um, without a payout, without a, without, a, without a drawback, which I've talked about before, right? That The difference between character sheet solutions and player solutions. Um, character sheet solutions are only fun if there's a, if there's a trade-off. If, you're, if you have a, a cost-benefit analysis, if there's something you're giving up in order to use that character sheet, so, character sheet solution, right? Hit points is the classic example. Combat is a classic example. I'm going to use the combat skills I have on my character sheet to hit the enemy and kill them, but the risk is I could lose my hit points and die. Okay, that's a good cost-benefit. That's a good trade-off. Um, well, the systems I had developed were generous and quote-unquote realistic, right? Given the world that I had established, but they also completely undermined my my reason for including it. It was, it's, like, it's like the inclusion of Goodberry. It's my example. If you have a game where Goodberry exists, you no longer have the benefit. There, there's no reason to include food uh, uh, rations because the Goodberry spell undermines that. So the players pick it. You don't ever track it again, and the players don't have a reason to use it. So, you, so they feel cheated, right? So they, they have a character sheet solution that they never have to use because... The fact that they have it on their sheet negates the use for the system as a whole. 
So you, you present them with uh, rations. You know, there's no reason to spend time on it if you have a good berry. Okay, great. Then you've just wasted, they've wasted a spell slot and you have, uh, you, you've developed that system for no reason. You've emphasized that system for no reason. So it's a, it's a, it's a bad design in my mind. It's a bad design. I hate, I hate game elements that are negated by player choices that are then never utilized. Basically, that's what that means. <laughs> uh, okay, so again, leaving that aside, my, my gripe with Goodberry aside, encumbrance is necessary. You might not use OSE's version of encumbrance, right? You might not decide to use this either of these options presented, the basic encumbrance or the detailed encumbrance rules. You might use a slot-based system, but if you're going to run an old-school game, you need encumbrance. That's that's my that's my pontification for, <laughs> for this one. Um, it, again, it, it, the rest of the book. Well, I'm going to go through it, but but it has some stuff that I like, some things I don't like. The ability checks I don't use. I don't like systems that divide ascending and descending checks, right? Where you have to roll over and under. Some people don't mind it at all. Some people, like my players, tend to prefer it one way or the other. I prefer it one way or the other. So that's one of the reasons why old school essentials didn't appeal to me and doesn't appeal to my players initially is because it's like, okay, no, yeah. Now again, it's one of those things where if you know it. You're like, dude, it's so easy. Ability checks, you roll under or equal. Attack rolls, you're rolling over. You're trying to roll your fake out. It's, it's, uh, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to, <laughs> you have to roll on that table. It's, it's easy. And, and yeah, it's easy for, for people who have done it. But it's a new system to learn, especially when you already know something. When you already know the one that you have in mind, or maybe a couple editions of the game in mind that do it differently, it is kind of a thing you have to overcome. You have to remember, and it slows things down. It gets in the way of the the moment-to-moment -moment fun. And because of that, again, coming from fifth edition, a lot of players, my players, were like, "Nah, uh, that that's I don't I don't. Let's just stick with the rollover. Why do we do under?" And you know that they're 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 habituated to be excited with it when they roll a twenty, and they don't like that feeling of yes, oh man, they don't like that. Right? The, I rolled a twenty. Oh wait, that's bad. Oh right, that's bad here. We don't want to roll a twenty. So. Again, just something that you, you get over time. So I don't really, I don't use these ability checks here. But death, destruction of items, healings, and the saving throw, uh, stuff that they lay out here, great stuff. Again, totally good. And the healing that I, um, I don't, I, I use this, or I use uh, Shadow Dark, or a variant on the Shadow Dark healing system now. Uh, but the idea that healing is slow, also really important for that old school vibe. Very important for the old school vibe. Which is one of the things that I've changed about Shadow Dark. You know, Shadow Dark has all of your hit points, all of your abilities come back on a long rest. Um, I don't, or on a regular rest, it's just one kind of rest in Shadow Dark. I don't do that. I use the end of the odd, um, where, you know, hit points and flesh things. So as you take damage down to zero, then your constitution score starts going down after that. And that only heals back one point a day. Whereas your hit points um, come, come back to full. So it, it kind of builds in a a longer term damage system into Shadow Dark. And I prefer that to this uh, to this one hit point per day kind of thing. Uh, and, and also I prefer that to Shadow Dark's fully healed every day. Uh, the categories of saving throws are another thing that I understand the reason for. And I, I like that there are differences, right? I like that death is different than wands, is different than breath attacks. But the benefit in my mind, the complication of this of these five saving throw categories doesn't make up for the benefit you get from it. Because, again, in Shadow Dark, you just make checks. Attack checks, ability checks, saving checks. They're all checks. There's just you roll for each one. So if someone casts a spell against your dexterity, you roll a dex check to try to avoid it. You know, you make a dex check to try to use acrobatics, use a dex check to attack with a bow. It's just dex. Everything's dex. Um, is that different enough than breath attacks as a category? I don't, I don't, I, to me it seems to be, uh, I'd prefer to have the simplicity of the six ability scores, which we already have, tying the, the, the saving throws right directly to them and just calling them checks. Now, here's the thing, right? With every simplification, you lose an element of functionality. And there's a certain functionality to the categories here that lets you be a bit more granular. Okay, this class is better at saves against wands than it is against breath attacks. This class is better at spells, rods, and stabs than it is against wands. Although I, I have to admit, I've never understood why the difference between a rod and a wand is a different saving throw. I'm sure there's a reason for it, but I, in my mind, it doesn't it doesn't make like a big distinction to me. I don't see the difference there. Um, 
But it just mapping these on death and poison being a different save, that's constitution, right? It makes sense that a class that is high, or, or a class or, or a character that's high constitution would be better at resisting poison and death. Whereas not necessarily the case for this. So anyway, I can see why they do it, I, I, or at least some of it. I like the way that they do it. I prefer the way that Shadow Dark does it. And to that degree, I prefer the way that 5th edition does it, although I um, I don't like proficiency, and that further complicates things. So I'm glad that Shadow Dark is just 5th edition without proficiency, essentially, and that's one way of looking at the whole game. Hazards and challenges, once again, these things don't make... They're not, they're not threats in 5th edition, so reading through this book for the first time, seeing that overcoming the environment is a good portion of the game in old school games, that's, that's really cool. The, the idea that dark vision, although again, this game does have infravision. Uh, I like that Shadow Dark doesn't have any races with infravision or dark vision or anything like that. Um, but most creatures are not going to have that. Most creatures are not going to have this infravision, and so darkness really matters and uh, all of that. So again, good reminders that all of this stuff is here. Uh, I, I like all of that stuff too. Now this is where the book gets really good, is the sequences of play for Dungeon, Wilderness, uh, Overland Travel, all of that. Now, you know, uh, Questing Beast has a great breakdown of the dungeon adventuring turn, so I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, except to say that when I first discovered this, as I said, my dungeons got really, really good. I started to use this, and that consistency, the procedure that players, they, they, they fell, it, it works for the kind of game you're running in a dungeon crawl. You have a procedure. You know what's going to happen. You know the process. If you don't know the process, if the players can't rely on a consistent sequence, then they can't make a meaningful choice about whether to push on or pull back, or at least it's harder for them to do so because they know it's going to be much more up to the whims of the DM. Right? If I'm not rolling random encounters consistently when certain things happen or at certain times, then how do they know that they can risk more random encounters if they go in? Is it meta? Yeah, a little bit. But that's fine. It's a game. And the old school essentials, the old school knows that it's a game. Fifth edition it knows that it's a game, but it often gets caught up in itself and forgets that it's a game, I think, and tries to be very, very simulationist. Which is, sounds funny. I shouldn't say simulationist. It doesn't become simulationist. It becomes narrative. It becomes very, very much a narrative rather than a game. You might say that that is a game. I, I, don't, I don't want to get into that too much. But you, you hope you guys get my distinction there, what I'm saying. So, by going through the wandering monsters at the certain times, you know, checking to see the character's actions, describing and the end of turn, having a wandering monster process, knowing that when you encounter a wandering monster, it's going to be 2d10, 6 times 10 feet away. So you have that, you know, 20 to 120 feet of range for random encounters. Knowing, knowing that that's a consistent thing that can happen. Again, it's meta, but it makes the player's choices grounded in actual information. They know the game, and they can use the game to help them. That's 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 good. Again, some players, some DMs, some tables are not going to like that. I do, and I think that my players do. Again, the more that I, the more that I do it, and the more that I'm consistent with it, because when I hand wave, when I say, "Ah, it's probably fine," then it undermines a lot of that whole. Well, then why did we bother all of this build up? And I'll give you an example of what I mean. I was actually playing in my friend's fifth edition game, uh, just just last night, and in that fifth edition game. Uh, we were going to be exploring a wilderness region. It was, so I'm playing in a West Marches. I decided to play in his, uh, just to you know, at least play a few times. And uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're exploring. One of the, uh, the, the NPCs had hired people to take him out and go explore the region and map it and stuff. So we had to worry about supplies. We had to worry about you know, all of these things. And, and that was great. We started to go out. We, we, we had pack animals, we loaded them up, we were calculating how many days we could stay out and what the risks were and where we could might drop supplies. We were attacked by wolves and one of the one, two of the mounts went down actually. Um, and that was a big deal because they were dead and now we, had, we couldn't take as much supply with us. It was a big deal and we kept playing and then we got to the very end, it was getting late, and uh, the DM, and understandably, because he's, he's a 5th edition DM, he's not interested in this part of the game so much. It was kind of a, it was kind of a more of a fun flavor adventure. It was like, yeah, and you guys can make it back fine. <laughs> and I, I kind of, you know, I, I was fine at the time. I was really late. I was grateful that we could end the, the session. And because it's West Marches, we were supposed to get back. But there was no role to return or anything like that. There was no risk. And I was left wondering, why did we bother with the half an hour of planning? Why did we bother with the calculations about how far we could go and how many nights we could stay out? And 
when really all we had to do was the first half. Right? All we had to worry about was getting out there. So actually losing the pack animals was like really losing like seven silver or something because a mule is like seven silver, right? Like, so actually what we lost was not much. So because there was no consistency, because there was no procedure that we had to follow and we knew we had to follow, okay guys, we're getting close to the end of the session. If we're going to go back, we got to go back now. Because I wasn't there, our choices were undermined. And again, it was totally understandable given the situation, given it was late, we had been playing, we fought a couple, we fought a couple random encounter combats that were really close and it was, it was interesting. It was a fun session. I don't want to say it wasn't fun. But that particular element was totally undermined. And as a result, I was like, well, why did we do it? I would rather have ignored all of that and had an extra half an hour of combat, had an extra half hour of role playing, have an extra half an hour of just, you know, hanging out with them. Why did we bother with this whole system? Because it wasn't consistent, because it wasn't applied. So that's what I mean. When you, when you adopt these things and you move them into your game, you find that there actually is, it seems onerous. It seems like you're, you're, it seems like you're being actually friendly and kind to your players when you don't do this, when you don't insist on these rules. But actually, I find you're, you're in the moment, they might be grateful like I was. Okay, good, I get to go to bed. In the long run, I find that I'm like, well, now I'm not going to bother with that style of adventure. I'm not going to bother planning. I'm not going to worry about supplies. I'm not going to worry about camping. Because I know he'll just say we get back, <laughs> right? And maybe he won't. Maybe one time he'll say, you know what? No, I'm going to insist that you guys do it. And then I'll be like, okay, well, uh, last time we didn't, I didn't. I, uh, can we say that I, right? You, you get the point. If he decides then to be consistent with it or decides to be hard about it, then all of the habit that we have developed disappears. So consistency is so important in this stuff and the procedures therefore help with that consistency. So it's why I like this game quite a lot. And I encourage you, if you're interested in an old school game, fight the temptation to quote unquote, be kind to your players and hand wave elements of this. Because ult I mean, unless you do it every time, unless you do it every time, but if it's like this session, I'm gonna say you guys don't, or that session, and no, you're not gonna, you know, whatever we're gonna, not to say you shouldn't do it, but question that motive. And, and, and maybe think about what you're doing long, long, in the long term by undermining that procedure. Okay, so anyway, searching and how searching works, I think, again, it's great. Beautiful, beautiful art. I love this one. This one's more new school than old school, but I like it a lot. Uh, wilderness Adventuring, same thing here. Sequence of play per day. Decide your course, lose direction, wandering monster description, end of day. That was another thing too, is our, our mission was all about exploring yesterday. And I, I'm, I'm thinking about this because we just had sort of an exploration adventure. Our mission was all about exploration. And yet we didn't have to worry about keeping, not getting lost. We didn't have to worry about, you know, losing direction. We didn't have to worry about that sort of thing. We rolled for random encounters and that was it. Now, again, I, I, I the adventure itself was super fun. I had a great time. It was a, uh, the group of people I was playing with were really fun. It was just awesome. But the system itself wasn't necessarily contributing to that. The sequence of play, like the, the mechanics weren't contributing to the fun I was having. It was the people around the table. It was the jokes we were making. It was the combat that we had. That, that stuff was what I had fun with, which is often the case with fifth edition, right? It's not the system that really is, really draws you in and you have fun with. It's the people, it's the adventure, it's the story, it's the, it's the combats, it's the, the jokes. But that's you know, true for almost any game. <laughs> One of the reasons why I've moved away from 5th edition. I like systems where the game itself is enjoyable to play and, and draws me in more than 5th edition does. So distance and measurement, how flying works, how foraging works, how hunting works. Again, procedures that are consistent. You know if, I'm, if we decide to go through the jungle hex, if we decide to try to you know, cross that jungle, we are going to go 50% slower. Again, is that realistic? Is it always going to be 50% slower to travel through a jungle if you want, want, as opposed to going around it? No, but in a game, you do need to know that. Okay, great. So we can make more meaningful choices by having it be consistent. So a lot of DMs, I think, are hesitant to use these sorts of things because it seems very gamey, but it is a game. And we, we can't forget that it is a game. And, and by, by accepting that, we can actually have a lot of fun with that game by providing concrete established rules for our players. You know, this, this video is becoming a lot more ranty than I was initially intending it to be. <laughs> I, I, I just, honestly, this book is so good. It makes me remember how good exploration as an element of D&D is. But in order for it to be good, you really have to follow sequence. You really have to insist on certain kinds of difficulties and certain kinds of requirements. 
cutting certain aspects out of the game and, and adding in more. And so OSC, again, if you're interested in adding in that third pillar of D&D, OSC is a great way to start with it. Okay, because here's a structure that you can use to, to build off of and to, to go into other, uh, into other things. Waterborne adventuring. Encounters, and again, the same thing with encounter sequence. Knowing when to check for surprise, uh, light and surprise. If both sides are surprised, what that might mean, how initiative works. Now, side-based initiative is something that I love. I have decided that side-based initiative is so much superior to individual initiative. It's so good. Is there a benefit for individual initiative? Absolutely, sure. Some people really like having my character, one of my character's things is that I, I go first every round, basically. I can always act before the enemy. Great, and, and so there is a certain level of fun that is had with individual initiative, don't get me wrong. The downside of, of individual initiative is, especially when you combine individual initiative with a slow combat game, a slower combat game like 5th edition, 4th edition, what you get is checking out. Either it's my turn and I'm engaged, or it's the enemy's turns and some of them are attacking me, in which case I'm engaged, or I'm checked out. Now there is another alternative and that's you're a player who constantly gives other people suggestions about what they should do on their turn. That can almost be worse. <laughs> that can be super annoying. The player who's constantly saying, oh no, 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 don't do that, do this. Who's trying to play every character at once. Now, often that, that happens because most of the players check out, except the player whose turn it is and the player who's trying to control the, the battle. <laughs> but what I found with side-based initiative is that it is much more collaborative. Everybody's engaged because either it's your turn or it's the enemy's turn. There is no downtime. It's not like, okay, I've taken my action. Now the next player gets to take, take his. Everybody has to act. And the way I do it is everybody declares their action and then they all uh, act simultaneously. So instead of saying, hey, uh, you can choose which order you want to do, um, you know, you act and then you act, actions are resolved simultaneously. So we all declare and we can decide what we're going to declare. We can talk together and I let people talk. But then once everyone says, okay, I'm going to do this, you can do that, I'm going to do this, then they all actually act at the same time. That keeps everybody engaged. And it allows for cool things like, okay, we really need this ogre oh, dead. So everybody attack it, even though... Technically, if one of us hits it, we could kill it, but we really need to make sure it dies, so we're all going to attack it. Then you get that overkill moment. I think that's cool. Even though there's some wasted attacks, it's still, it's still better. It still adds for that cool uh, that dynamic. So for that end, I don't roll a d20, I roll a d6. Simple enough, you roll a d6. Side goes first, or goes second. My players have taken to it like water. It's so much more intuitive, so much more fun, so much more engaging than individual initiative. And I, I understand DM's hesitancy, especially in fifth edition, because in fifth edition combat is so much more, uh, it's a so, so much more central part of the game. It takes so much longer that it seems like, well, if I have all of the enemies go and then all of the players go, and then you roll again, and the players go immediately again, you know, it just, it's, it's, it just takes out a lot of the, but even in fifth edition, when I've been using it in fifth edition, it's so much more fun. So I'm switching to side-based initiative basically from here on out. Um, one of the things I'm not doing is, I'm, as you'll see later, that the, the, <laughs> you have to declare spells before you roll initiative or before, yeah. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I don't do that. But I do require all the players to declare what their actions will be. Um, so I, I, I do like that quite a lot. So initiative, side-based, beautiful. I love it. How actions work and the different actions you can take. Pretty straightforward. Pretty simple. The stuff that you might expect. But there is an evasion idea here. Um, and how pursuit works, which you can see on the next page. There is an actual procedure for evasion, which is so important uh, for both you know, monsters chasing players and vice versa, players chasing monsters. Because so often, I'll tell you, so often outside of old school games and this procedure, fleeing is so boring. In fifth edition, it's so boring. Monsters run away and it's like, okay, he's run 60 feet. Now I'm gonna run 30 feet. Okay, great. Um, uh, so he runs 60 feet, I run 50 feet. Okay, so I'm, I'm now 40 feet back. All right, so I'm still within range of an attack. Okay, good. Now he runs another 60 feet, I run another 50 feet. Okay, great, so now I'm 50 feet back. All right, I'm gonna like that's how often it works, right? You just do, 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 until the battle's over. Because players don't like creatures to get away. Right? They just don't like that. But the opposite is true. If a player wants to run away and a monster wants to pursue them, then it's just, he's just chasing you. Okay, I'm, I move 60, he moves 50, he gets to attack me with his range. I move 60, he moves 50, he gets to attack. Whatever it is, right? Or they're catching it, whatever. It's just, it's, it doesn't make sense. So having an actual procedure. If the fleeing set is faster, it automatically succeeds. If the fleeing set is not faster, then you get a pursuit. 
and you have to roll. Each side is going to be running at full speed. There's a line of sight question. You can drop treasure. You can drop food. You can drop obstacles. And then you can, can't get map. There's some exhaustion and effects of exhaustion. And then you can rest to get that back. So it's so much more... Uh, I don't know, I just like it so much more, <laughs> so much more. Now there is still a, a little bit of like, okay, I'm trying to, I, I move this distance, you move that distance. But the idea that, okay, I'm gonna, there's a procedure for line of sight. Most monsters will not continue pursuit if a character gets out of a monster's line of sight. That's awesome. And dropping treasure, dropping food, dropping obstacle, you know, dropping oil, meaningful ways to stop pursuit. A uh, great piece of art there. I love that. Combat and how combat works. Again, D6 initiative. I don't do slow weapons. I don't do individual initiative. I don't declare spells and melee movement. Um, I do morale and I do, uh, I don't do the movement in melee and all that stuff. I just leave all that stuff out. Simplicity. Spell casting is great. Uh, all that stuff. I love, I, I really do like this book quite a lot for its procedures because again, it's super clear. Uh, initiative. Monster morale. Movement. Uh, actions. And you switch over. Just have it check, 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 check. Now, if you're going to use this much more complicated system, declare spells and melee movement, then initiative, then slow weapons, um, you know, if you're going to do that, then having this check system really does help. But even if you simplify it a little bit, it's, uh, as I do, it's uh, still useful to have that. Other combat issues and morale. I love the morale rules here. I think every system should have a morale rule set, even if you don't use this one. I use the morale... Um, ratings for the monsters in these books for most of my monsters regardless of what book I'm using. It's one of the reasons I have them nearby is that if I really need a monster to make a morale check I'll open up the old school essentials book and look at the morale and roll and try to see if it breaks its morale. That's it. So morale rules are awesome. Uh, combat tables, one of those things that you know a lot of people just don't like and it's one of the reasons why the the, 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 the Thaco to hit armor, armor class zero and the attack matrix I just don't use it. My players don't use it. I know that it's not that complicated, right, once you actually wrestle with it. But there's a reason we've moved away from it. There's a reason people bounce off of it. Yeah, so <laughs> that's that. The great notes for running games. Now, I, I don't think the advice given in this book is is the reason for the book, right? It's, it's good, solid advice. It's good, solid advice throughout. But it's also just pretty standard. There are better books for designing adventures. There are better books for designing dungeons. There are better books for designing wilderness. Of a lot more random tables in those books and things like that. Rules for uh, awarding XP. And uh, one of the things I wish this book did was give a better argument for why treasure should be the experience. <laughs> why treasure should be the experience. But um, it doesn't really give you that argument. And the open game license in the index table. So this book, and then it has some extra tables at the back of the book where you can you know, print out and use in a DM screen. The classic... Old school fantasy book. Now, I'm going to, much more briefly, it's been 40 minutes already, but I'm much more briefly going to go through the characters, the magic, the monsters, and the treasures. Um, because I do want to quickly go through and just give a couple of uh, things that I, that I think are really awesome about them and notes about them. Uh, but, the, but I think that the adventure book is what, what I like so much because it has that, it's a touchstone. You can always come back to it and say, am I drifting away from... The design of this old school, right? Am I drifting in this direction or that direction? And you can use the procedures to see. Okay, this is the, the, the standard. If I vary it, I'm going to be moving in one direction or the other. I'm going to be moving more crunchy. I'm going to be moving more uh, smooth, right? I'm going to be moving more simplified, more streamlined. Why would I want to do that? This system works. It's cool. Why would I want to move away from it? Well, because in this way, I found it works better at my table or my players prefer that. Okay, awesome. Then you make the change, right? So, but it's sort of like the, the the recipe, the cookie cutter. You you look at it, you start with it, and then you modify from it if you think uh, you can do it better, or you think your players would prefer it more, or you prefer it more. But as a, as the standard, as the place to go for these procedures, for the ways to run dungeon crawl, the way to run overland travel, hex crawling, this seems to me to be the the, the gold standard. Now, characters, once again. I, this book is one that I haven't used as much simply because I haven't played this game as a player. I, I, I mean, I haven't played it that much at all. Certainly not as a DM, certainly not as a player. This is not my, my, my go-to. So while I've read through these books, this isn't where I spend most of my time with the character books. Now, that being said, I think it's really well laid out. I mean, really well laid out. Very clear. And the characters... Um, the classes are so simple. Two-page spreads for almost everything. 
You get what you're... You get it right there. Dwarf. Demi-human class. Boom requirements. Boom combat. What they do. Progression. Saving throws. That's it. With usually a piece of art for each one. That fits with the flavor. So the classes are so simply laid out. Now again, this is in a way the gold standard. I think if you're going to do races, classes... Um, you, you know that you're going to be referencing these sorts of ideas. You're going to be bouncing into these sorts of ideas, bouncing off these sorts of ideas, modifying these sorts of ideas. How advancement works, high-level play. Wealth, one of the one of my problems with old school, without, without any game for D&D is spending money. There's not a lot to spend money on. But this game has strongholds, and that is something that you can spend money on. <laughs> you can spend a lot of money on strongholds if you start to do that as you level up. Equipment, that actually matters. Right? Because equipment doesn't matter <laughs> in most uh, newer games. These equipment does. Weapons and armor. Basic ideas for weapons and armor. I like all this stuff. Vehicles. Animals of burden. I, I use these animals uh, as my kind of standard. <laughs> Again, um, Shadow Dark has a lot of them too, but I, I, I use these. Uh, these books are mostly not out. I don't usually use the character books out, but... Okay, now, I have a question about this piece of art. Why is the old wizard the one rowing the boat? I mean, I'm all for, you know, you know, not being ageist and stuff. But he's an old wizard. He shouldn't be the one rowing the boat. The young dude should be rowing the boat. The guy with the spear. <laughs> but no, the old wizard is the one rowing the boat. I think that's just a funny piece of art. It's a beautiful piece of art. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But I just always, I've always found that to be funny. It's an old dude. Uh, hired help. Now, also another thing I think this book does really well is it presents the stuff that the players should know in the player's book. Not a lot of the extra stuff. Just the player's stuff. This is the stuff that they're going to need to know. And again, consistency. So you might have a world where there aren't mercenaries to hire. But giving the players the book where they can hire mercenaries, knowing what they're equipped with, knowing, again, it's gamey, but knowing their morale, knowing how much they cost, knowing their AC, that sort of thing is important for the players to know. That way they can make decisions. Okay, you know, we need to attack that dragon. We're going to need some help. Okay, well, how much does a footman cost? How many footmen can we hire in the area? Okay, there's only four. Okay, heavy footmen. Okay, four heavy footmen. Great, well, let's hire them. We know we have to pay them this much. They're probably all going to die, um, but we'll, we'll hire them anyway. This is, what we're gonna, this is what we get after hiring them. So having that consistency in the book for the players is important. Same thing with specialists. Again, same thing with strongholds. They know what they're getting as they do it. So I, I absolutely love having this stuff in the players' hands because it gives them tools. That they can then say, hey, I, I, we should do this. We should do that. Um, and again, more information is better than less information. The advanced book is very similar, right? We're talking about more classes, more races, and then the idea of race as, or not race as class. So you can kind of split them. Um, that's something that the advanced book suggests. Which makes a lot of sense to me. I, you know, us again, I started with third edition. So the split race class thing was my, my standard. It's what, I, it's what I knew going into the game. So getting into race as class was a bit strange to me. Now, I kind of get the idea, but I still, I still appreciate being able to split them, race and class. One of the reasons why I think Dragon Slayer, I like that a lot. That, that's the assumption is that you're going to split your race and class. And also, uh, while, while also still limiting the, the classes that every race can pick, um, I like that that's the assumption. Uh, and, and I think the same thing is true. Whereas in this, it seems like you kind of have to give players both books and say, okay, no, we're going to use all of these extra rules. Here's the special stuff. Make sure you read the advanced rules for how to pick your race and then pick your class. It, it, it's more work to do the race-class combination as opposed to uh, as opposed to um, the original. Or, sorry, the original. <laughs> Dragon Slayer, I should say. Again, one of the reasons why I like that particular presentation, that particular assumption better. Uh, but no, not everybody minds that. Nobody cares. Quite good. Poisons, <laughs> and you know, part of me is like, why is the poisons in the player's book? Well, because this is the book with the assassin or thieves, right? So they should know what kind of poisons are out there. So you give the player who is the assassin or the thief this book, and they can talk about poisons. Oh, okay, so we want to kill the count. Well, maybe we should use a bloodstream poison then. So use a type two bloodstream poison. That should probably work. And he's probably not going to have more than twenty five hit points. It takes effect real quick. So you know, like the, the idea is okay. We know how to. We, it's the guy who's using the poison that knows it, as opposed to him to him saying, "Hey, DM." Uh, what poisons are there? And the DM opening the DM's guide and swiping, you know, swatch, uh, flipping back through to the poison section saying, oh, okay, here's the poison. So I like that it's in this book. The same thing with the advanced rules. The players 
uh, the players are the ones who are using these abilities, so they should have them in their book. Um, Cross-classing, secondary skills, weapon proficiencies, and the open gaming license uh, with some of these extra tables in the back. So the character books are, again, I think my least favorite, not because they're bad, just because I use them the least uh, in other games. But the magic books, now these are awesome, mostly just for the spells. Uh, well, obviously, <laughs> just for the spells. That's what the magic books are. But the spells are so good. So good. And the power level of these spells is so mind-blowing. I love, love, first of all, the art. It's awesome in this book. But I love the power level of the spells here. Light, for example. Um, just the, the power of a spell like light. It makes it, it makes magic really magical. Really impactful. If you're going to play a wizard, you need to have a cool ability. Even at level one. Level one wizards get one spell and they're done. Right? They, they need to have something cool. One of the reasons I prefer Shadow Dark, again, to Old School Essentials is because you have the chance to keep your spells. In fact, you're, you're likely to keep your spells. The power level of them has been reduced to, to keep up with that idea that you're not just going to cast one powerful spell and then be done. But the spells are still pretty good in Shadow Dark. And I like that they are way more powerful in terms of utility than the spells in 5e. And again, part of that has to do with what 5e is aiming at. 5e isn't aiming at utility I mean, their spells are almost all combat related. There are some non-combat abilities, but they almost all relate to getting into combat in more meaningful or in more powerful positions <laughs> or maneuvering in combat better. There are lots of utility spells in 5e, don't get me wrong. But the power level of them of the power level of them is significantly reduced. Charm person, for example, in 5e is really limited. Charm person in this book, incredibly strong. As is Charm Person in Shadow Dark, by the way, one of the best spells in the game, in my opinion. Magic user spells, yeah. One or more days duration. And it can just continue on. You get a new save once every day if you have high intelligence, but a new save once every month if you have low intelligence. That's awesome, man. That's so awesome. These spells are great. And again, just for almost any game, you use these as your basis. If you have the kind of wizards that this game has, right? Now, Shadow Dark, again, like I said, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting comparison. OSE, Shadow Dark, and 5e. 5e wizards have a lot more castings, but it's a limited amount. It's, it's, it's a limited amount of ammunition, but you know how much you have. And it's it's significant. It's a, it's a lot per day. I mean, even a level one wizard, you're getting a couple spell slots per day. You have cantrips. You can cast those over and over and over. So you have consistency and you have, uh, you know, you can, you can hang in there all day. You can use your cantrips over and over and over, especially if you have the more powerful ones. Firebolt, for example, d10 damage at level one every turn really good. Well, in Shadow Dark, you have Magic Missile, which is almost guaranteed at level 1. It's a d4, <laughs> right? So it's significantly weaker. Maybe it's a d6. I think it's a d4. Significantly weaker, but it automatically hits, and you're pretty much guaranteed to get it back over and over. You can fail it. You can lose it, but you have advantage inherently on casting it. And it's a dc11, so you're probably going to get it unless you roll really badly and really unlucky. That's great, but it does take up your slot, and there are, in my opinion, better spells. Charm Person, for example. So Shadow Dark has fewer casting. You have that unlimited possibility of casting, but you could also lose your spell at any time. You could lose at the very first casting. So the spells are less, they're more powerful than 5e, but they're less powerful than OSE. And again, in, in Old School Essentials, you have very powerful spells, but a very limited number of them, especially early on. So, you know, when you're designing spells, when you're adding spells into your game, when you're picking spells from other systems to add in, which should you draw from? 5e level spells, Shadow Dark level spells, OSE level spells? Well, what kind of magic user do you want? Do you want a magic user who is another kind of, right, uh, <laughs> who, who is even to the other kind of uh, classes, right? Do you want all the classes to be equal and even, right? They have different areas that they might be expert, have expertise in. Uh, some might be more consistent. Some might be better in this sorts of circumstances, but they all are useful always, <laughs> basically, right? They're all pretty useful in almost any circumstance. Then you're gonna wanna go with the 5e level of magic because they're, they're comparable to the sorts of things that other classes could do in other ways. Um, if you want casters that are more swingy, that have that potential to be really, really more powerful than everybody else over the course of an entire session, but also have the potential to be useless 
uh, then you go with Shadow Dark level spells and that kind of magic. And if you want people who have one nuke that they can use once, basically, right? A very limited number of very powerful things so that they're basically useless until moments when they are incredibly powerful, then you go with old school essentials. And that level of magic, that kind of magic. This is such an incredible piece of art, too. I love that. Great spells in both of these books. Just really, really cool. Man, I love old school essentials spells. And the art in these books is awesome. I love that piece. Something about the color of it, the uh, purple with the, uh, with the autumn leaves is really cool to me. Yeah, these, these, these books have just really incredible, uh, incredible spells. I love, I love uh, some of these illusionist spells. The illusionist, the illusionist is such a cool class. Uh, it's a shame that illusionist has kind of disappeared out of 5e. Uh, and I'm not sure why. I mean, illusion magic is one of the kinds of magic in 5th edition, but it's really one of the weakest kinds of magic. I don't really know people who pick illusion very much. Monster book. This is where this is what it's all about. Man. The monster manual here. One of these days, I'm going to do a comparison of uh, owl bears. I know that someone else, someone else has already done that on others. So there's sort of that that's sort of the joke, right? That you compare owl bears from various editions of the game. But I want to do that. I want to go through the different all the different books that I have in terms of game systems, all the monster manuals I have, and try to find every owl bear and then compare them system to system and see how they differ. Because it's it's <laughs> it's one of those things where you you wonder how much more powerful than they are relative to the level of the game. Uh, might be sort of like a touchstone for that game. Absolutely, absolutely love the monsters in this book. And again, they are the gold standard in my view. I'm constantly referring back to this book whenever I look at a monster manual from another game, whenever I just want to bring in new creatures, whenever I want to see relatively interesting stat blocks, um, with a couple interesting ideas that are outside of the, you know, the fifth edition stuff that I have. Mostly these are a little less powerful, but looking at the Banshee, comparing the D&D whale to the whale here. Save versus death or die. 5e, it's dropped to zero hit points. So there's a very big difference between dropping to zero hit points and dying. So the Banshee in old school essentials, man, that's, that's a, a dangerous thing to run into. Um, Oops. Flail snails. Uh, really creepy ghast here. I love that. Uh, creatures larger than ogres are unaffected. That's interesting because that's not the case. I think it's just humanoids maybe in 5th edition. But uh, but my, maybe not. It might be uh, just any creature. Brutal creatures here. I love how small the Tarasque is here compared to how he is now. He's, he's 50 feet long. But in 5th in edition he's like... Uh, He's like Godzilla size. Really great book. I love this monster manual. And then, of course, we get the treasures. Now, one thing that's awesome about old school treasures is their power level, once again. Magic items in old school games are really, really good. They're game-breakingly good, and that's why you got to be so careful about them. They're game-breakingly good in this particular way. Sometimes, like, 5th edition magic items can be game-breaking, but it's, it's usually just because the game isn't designed to... It's really not designed for plus three, plus two, plus one magic items. Like giving someone a plus one magic item, it just really does unbalance the game a bit. Um, giving a plus three magic item is just over. But in old school games, some of the powers of these items are so high. And again, it goes back to the philosophy of the game. Oh, I love this style of art. This is the Dolmenwood style of art. I think this artist is the one working on a lot of the Dolmenwood books. Love it, love it, love it. So when you're talking here about the different magic items, you'll see that some of them are just way stronger than their 5th edition version. Sometimes not. I like this piece of art too. That's such a good one. Man, that's awesome. I might just... Man, I just want to set this as my background. I wish it didn't have the crack down the middle. I'll try to find this one without the, the page to divide online. Sentient swords. That's a thing that's basically lost in a lot of the new systems. I mean, it's not. They're, they're, you can still get them in 5th edition, but... Um, I, I, this is off. This has kind of become a comparison to fifth edition for me, uh, because again, I, I have a lot of experience very recently playing it, and um, I'm more and more convinced of the the excellence of the old school. The more I have been exposed to it now, and then still continue to play fifth edition as I as I delve into the old school. Really cool stuff in here. Now, actually, you know, a lot of them are similar. 
the, the, the names are, are the same, a lot of the mechanics are the same, but relative to the power level of the game, right, they're very different. That's one thing that I noticed about 5th edition is that 5th edition um, took a lot of old school stuff and ported it in without really thinking about necessarily what it might do to the game if you added it in or if you, if you built a game around that sort of thing. Or they tried to limit them to make them non-game breaking and in so doing made them really feel not terribly, not terribly too interesting. Anyway, enough griping about 5th edition. Old school essentials book is incredible those procedures that's kind of what i'm what i wanted to talk about today was the procedures really and that's what i spent most of the day talking about most of the video talking about the procedures in old school essentials are absolutely incredible but the reason for them right having this consistency in all of your in all of your games so that your players can make meaningful choices as they proceed in these dungeon crawl style games these these more hex crawl sandboxy old school games it's so important and the presentation of them in shadow uh, sorry excuse me in old school essentials is top notch so again you owe yourself um you owe it to yourself to go through the old school essentials books and look at how they do all of these different procedures dungeon crawling random encounter checks overland movement checks encumbrance initiative combat spell casting and say what am i doing in comparison to this and how is what i'm doing better and again like i've i've Given many, given many examples where I change it because I think I, I found a way that's better for my table than what Old School Essentials presents. But that's still a consideration, and, you, and I think you, you owe it to your table, you owe it to yourself, your your, your game, to, to to consider that, to do those calculations, to do that to, to do, do that work, and to not just fall into every aspect of one game and say, well, I'm, I'm just going to play it as is because it's simpler. So, well, you might actually find that if you drop, even in a game like 5th edition, right, I'm going to drop individual initiative and I'm going to add in group of initiative and just see what that does to your game. I think you'll find it's better. All right, guys. Well, I know this has been a very long video. <laughs> uh, thank you if you made it all the way to the end. Uh, and I, uh, I will see you guys in another one.